Hello everyone, this is chapter two. We're going to talk about organizational strategy and how modern firms are creating strategic competitive advantages through investments in information technology. You have a chapter opening case. It's on Grubhub, which is a online company that provides mail order food. And this is becoming more sophisticated these days with the advent of uh, drones and as, as you can imagine dealing with food which which uh, you have to deal with spoilage and rot and breakage of inventory is very challenging uh, and to do so um, without human interface without customers carrying the product out of a store is very challenging uh, so you know your, your book uh, talks about Grubhub and some of its competitors such as e24delivery.com and you may have noticed that some um, traditional stores uh, are starting to do this as well so I think it's a fascinating case for you to read section 2.1 is about business processes so this whole idea of a process is really the focus of organizational re-engineering efforts and if you've heard of total quality management the focus is on the process and it's important because processes cause outcomes or results and we, we you know you can read books about results and, and but really what's important is the processes which is the thing that affects results the most uh, what happens before the process are inputs. So the, the flow is inputs, processes, and outputs. We also have feedback. These four elements form a uh, system in any context, such as weather systems, um, a computer, a bird, a tree, grass. Uh, these, all of these things have input, process, output and feedback mechanisms. So this is general systems theory if you want to learn more about that. Um, inputs for a business are materials, services, and information that flow through and are transformed as a result of process activities. An example of an input is an order form from a customer. Of course this would be an input for a, a sales transaction process. And then we, so we have the inputs, we have the processes, we also have outputs. When a customer receives a product, this is the output for the business process. If this order is not fulfilled, then that means the output or the result wasn't very good. So we have a quality by which we do these things. Also important in this, in this discussion is the idea of resources. Resources are the people and equipment that perform the processes. The manufacturing equipment of a company um, that a company purchases is a resource for a business process. For example, any of the technology used in the process is a resource. Your book also talks about cross-functional processes. We talked about functions earlier, these distinct disciplines that are often separate from one another. We have cross-functional uh, processes uh, whereby these different discipline areas interact with each other and of course this can go outside the business as well. Table 2.1 in your book gives examples of business processes and you can see these are organized by the different functional areas and again some of these processes for example in marketing may talk to the processes in accounting. And this part of the table provides examples of production and operations management processes, HR business processes, and of course there are processes within uh, management information systems. For example, we're concerned with security issues such as antivirus control um, and training. Um, we want to generate the different policies um, and we want to manage services. We want to oftentimes have a help desk. Um, all of these are related to um, information systems. 
Processes are so vital for a company because if we engineer them well, if we're good enough at them, if we invest in them in a competent way, we can create a competitive advantage for our company. When we talk about a competitive advantage, we're referring to any asset, and that asset can be intellectual or physical. Any asset that provides an organization with an edge against its competitors in some measure, such as cost, quality, or speed. Your book describes the role of information systems in business processes. For example, fulfillment is triggered in the sales department. In this transaction or this uh, process, RFID tags, RFID is radio frequency identification. RFID tags and barcodes are used in capturing and storing process data, and this data can be written to a database, and that database can be networked to other applications. In this simple example, information technology supports a business process, and you can see also that if we do a really good job of this, then we can create a competitive advantage. There is a section case called uh, NASCAR uh, uses IT in its pre-race inspection. In this example, NASCAR uh, used uh, the, the process, a critical business process of pre-race inspection to uh, create visibility and uh, to ensure fairness. This diagram shows something that may be familiar to a lot of students. If you have reserved an airline ticket online using Travelocity or some other um, website, then uh, this may be familiar to you. So on the left hand side we see a traveler and you see this is a flow chart and logically this should make sense. We, we have logical flow here. Uh, we begin to plan a trip. We check flights. If seats are available, we continue on to submit an order. If seats are not available, we continue checking flights. So the diamond that you see where seats available uh, is shown is the logic. And there are several of those in this uh, diagram. On the right hand side, uh, where we have the blue background, you see that this is what happens at the um, airline website. So you see here we have two different um, agents interacting with each other, the traveler and the uh, airline website. And this depicts uh, logic. And what we're trying to do here is, number one, we're trying to understand the situation, understand the problem domain. And number two, we use this logic diagram to uh, develop uh, information systems applications. So it's a way of analyzing problems. We use various uh, charting methods and in information systems in uh, the development process. Section 2.2 is about change. Uh, the two primary mechanisms for change in any organization is radical and incremental. Your book calls these business process reengineering, which is the radical form of change, and business process improvement, which is the incremental uh, form of change. They are very different in that reengineering involves uh, top-down change that is driven by top management. Uh, it's usually done when there is a negative situation where the economy turns down and we have to change, we have to save costs. Business process improvement is bottom up. This is where we want to change. We want to improve to get better. We include uh, many organizational stakeholders and we listen to as many people as possible and gain knowledge from them and, and make the organization better. So your book says that BPR is the most difficult, radical, lengthy, and comprehensive uh, form of strategy for change and it refers to BPI as a methodology for achieving incremental improvements in the effectiveness and efficiency of a process. For example, many of you may have heard of Six Sigma. It's a popular BPI methodology. What it means is that we consider anything outside six standard deviations from the mean to be an error and we want to investigate those errors to improve the organization. BPI has a lot of terminology associated with it. It's, it's a massive discipline. A lot of people are familiar with W. Edwards Deming, who we're going to learn about later, and the quality revolution. So quality, uh, according to your book, is the result of optimizing the design, development, and production processes. We gain from this, oftentimes, uh, the quality uh, uh, initiatives, we gain differentiation. 
This is the result of optimizing the marketing and innovation processes. We also may attempt to achieve cost reduction. This is the result of optimizing operations and supplier processes. Your book talks about the control stage in BPI, which is characterized by establishing process metrics and monitoring the improved processes. Dashbar <laughs> dashboards are used in monitoring uh, process performance as well. We've mentioned dashboards before. An example of why we would be concerned with BPI is, uh, for example, as, as many of you are familiar with customer wait times, uh, we want to shorten the customer wait times, and that would be an example of an efficiency metric. This has been around for many years in restaurants. A third aspect of organizational change that we've not talked about yet is business process management, or BPM. This is a management system that includes methods and tools to support the design, analysis, implementation, management, and continuous optimization of core business processes throughout the organization. Your book has a closing case. It's about business BPR, BPI, and BPM at Chevron. Chevron initially utilized BPR to improve their supply chain, followed by employee-driven BPI initiatives, and then adopted a unified BPM approach to standardize business processes. Chevron employed Nimbus to provide detailed work instructions to its, um, to its employees. Chevron has used Lean Six Sigma, that should be familiar to you, I just described that, a methodology that combines statistical process analysis with techniques to eliminate waste and improve process flow since 2006. So BPR, BPI, and BPM. Uh, BPR is radical change, BPI is incremental, BPM is ongoing management of, of uh, change initiatives. Section 2.3 describes the environment of uh, any company and it talks about the business pressures that they face but also how organizations respond to this in particular uh, in terms of its IT investments. So in this diagram you see various forces uh, that are pressuring organizations. Uh, one important aspect of course is the customer and our relationships with customers and any information technology we build should not uh, interfere with our relationship with our customers and unfortunately some technologies do this in fact um, and, and management should certainly try to um, avoid this of course customer relationship management is an important uh, interest of managers and organizations it should be an organization-wide effort and what you want to do is maximize the customer experience you can think of it as someone sitting in a stadium and and you know trying to enhance their experience as much as possible as they interact with uh, your team or your um, organization. Another aspect is the environment. Of course, carbon management is something that's been recently talked about. IT has, certainly has a role in um, helping reduce pollution. Uh, this is something where we want to be good stewards of our space, and we want to. Um, you know, set a good example. We don't want negative PR. We want a clean environment. Everyone is an environmentalist, um, but this is a certainly an important uh, type of societal, political, and uh, legal pressure that's in the environment. Uh, corporations have every incentive to, to try to do the right thing because the public is always watching. Uh, another pressure here is government regulation. For example, Sarbanes-Oxley was passed uh, years ago as a form of government regulation. We have this uh, government regulations all the time um, as, as uh, the, the powers that be believe that they are necessary. Specifically, market pressures uh, can be viewed in three different ways. Strategic managers should always be aware of what's happening from a global standpoint. Of course, the, uh, the COVID-19 virus is a global phenomenon and it's unprecedented and managers have to, to be able to deal with this in a competent way, in a rational way, uh, often with the absence of information and people around them behaving both rationally and irrationally. 
Um, but one thing that never changes is that, you know, no matter who you're dealing with all over the world, customer demands are infinite. Also, the changing nature of the workforce, for example, uh, information technology um, has off, you know, with, with portability has brought about the idea of bringing your own device or BYOD. Um, this is a um, security related issue. If you have employees bringing their own device, then they can, of course, infect the organization with security holes and vulnerabilities that could have been unforeseen. So this is something that has to be managed. But the workforce is changing and the nature of the workforce is changing. Also, customers are more powerful than ever because we, you know, they can come into our establishment, whether it's online or not, and they can easily, um, uh, you know, with their, with their portable device, their phone or an iPad, they can go shopping elsewhere while they are in your store, while they're observing your, your uh, goods. So customers are more powerful than they've ever been. So another business pressure is also um, technolo technology driven. Technology is changing all the time and it's affecting everything that you will study in business. Uh, you, if you live long enough, you can see technological innovations occur. And as they occur, uh, what will also be happening is obsolescence. Uh, so whereas we used to have the uh, manual typewriter that became obsolete because of the electric typewriter. And then what made that obsolete was the computer and word processors. And so innovation brings about obsolescence. And so therefore, any technology has a certain lifespan. And that is something our organization has to, to manage, not just one uh, lifespan, of, you know, the lifespan of one uh, technology, but m maybe hundreds or thousands. For a high-tech company, all of this has to be monitored. Another example of a technology pressure is information overload. There is a tremendous amount of information available in the world. If you've read enough posts online, you know that some of it is useless and, and worthless information. And so the, you know, you can wear yourself out reading about the COVID virus, for example. Well, you know, how much of that energy is justified? Um, we have more information out there, more maps, more graphs, more charts, and and we can really exhaust ourselves reading about this phenomenon uh, and, and anything as well. I mean, we, we can get tremendous amounts of information these days with archival databases. That is not the issue these days. At one point in time, that was the problem. Now the problem is sifting through the information and finding what's most relevant. And so, you know, I, I would challenge all of you to try to understand things uh, from a minimalist, minimalist standpoint. What are the key pieces of information that you really need to know? Because all of the information isn't uh, the most relevant. It can't be. So your book also describes societal pressures on companies as well. These can be very strong, such as the social responsibilities. You have a case. Uh, it's about business. It's on solar-powered tablets in Ethiopia. In this case, there was an initiative called One Laptop Per Child, or OLPC. It was an experiment with solar-powered tablets that took place in Ethiopia. It was a major success. The goal of the OLPC experiment uh, was to improve literacy in children. So it just goes to show you all of the places in the world that can be touched by uh, appropriately applied information technology. And so I encourage you to read these other sections uh, on government regulations also, as we've mentioned. Protection against terrorist attacks, uh, that's going to be an ongoing uh, issue as we go forward. We are, you know, think about uh, ethical issues as well, such as, you know, people with disabilities needing to have access, um, as, as well as the um, digital divide, uh, dealing with poverty and, you know, race, gender related issues. You know, we want to treat everyone fairly. All of these things have to be embedded in our actions and our uh, information technology in the uh, global marketplace. 
So let's look at organizational responses to all of these pressures. From our perspective, from an information technology perspective, organizations respond by building systems that are strategic in nature. They are strategic responses and oftentimes we attempt to get ahead of society. Uh, and these these trends, uh, especially the technological trends that are causing all of this change. Strategic systems are defined in your book as any information system uh, that, if used properly, can provide competitive advantage by helping an organization implement its strategic goals and impro improve its performance and productivity. So from this, we're interested in improving the organization from one to five years out, which is very challenging in today's dynamic environment. We also respond as organizations by focusing more on customers. It is believed widely that if you lose um, track of your customers and what their demands are, for example, if gas prices shift dramatically, you may not have the automobiles that you produce that fit the gas prices and the demands of the of the uh, consumers. So with these shifts in mind, it is challenging to uh, remain focused on what customer demands are. We often use information technology for this purpose as well. Whereas mass production has been around for a long time, with information technology, modern organizations are far better at make to order and mass customization. If you've ever bought a Dell computer, you go online and you can select exactly the features you want and they will manufacture and produce that individual item for you. They will make it to order. Because they do this in mass, we consider this mass customization. Another way organizations respond is through e-business and e-commerce. Amazon, eBay, there are many companies available online, even groups are, are having a, a presence where you can join, you can subscribe, pay money uh, to join. They want to create affinity and all of this type of commerce that we generate through electronic means is known as e-business and e-commerce. Section 2.4 goes into detail about describing competitive advantages and how we develop strategic information systems for supporting specific purposes for, for the organization. This is a model by Michael Porter, as you see in the man on the right. He developed a competitive forces model. It is five forces. And so the first force is the threat of new entrants. We do not want more competitors. And companies will sue other companies to prevent them from entering into our business. We want entry barriers for our competitors. Another force is supplier power. Suppliers, when they're really big, when we really depend on them, can exert great pressure on us and reduce our profitability. Buyer power, this is our customers. Customers can be substantially important. For example, if we sell 90% of our product to Walmart and then they retail it later, then Walmart becomes really important to us and very powerful over us. And they can uh, lower the prices and, and, it, and squeeze us and make life more difficult for us. For example, banks have a lot of competition locally in addition to competing with online banks. This concept applies to the bargaining power of buyers and the web has a mixed impact on buyer, buyer power. In general, size matters regarding buyer power as well as supplier power. Fourth, we have rivalries. These are companies that compete side by side against our company. Um, when we have only, when we have no rivalries, we call this a monopoly. When we have a few, we call it an oligopoly. You may know that terminology from uh, management. When we have many rivals, then competition is more fierce. The fifth force in a competitive environment is the threat of substitute products. There is an actual um, case. Uh, it's about business, uh, the Weather Channel. 
The Weather Channel is a powerful and well-known brand that is actually losing viewers. Startups like Dark Sky could predict to the minute when it is going to start raining or snowing within the next hour because they integrate and analyze data to improve short-term forecasting. Some of you have multiple weather apps on your phone. This is an example of the threat of substitute products. Porter has another model that depicts the internal aspects of the organization, whereas the uh, competitive forces model describes the ex external environment of a company. The value chain helps managers think about and organize their internal uh, operations. He calls this the value chain model. So the, va the value chain model is made up of primary and support activities. Primary activities are those in which employees directly touch and influence the product or service. They may directly interface with the customers. Support activities are thing, uh, you know, employees that do not directly touch the product or interact with customers. This is the actual value chain model as conceived by Dr. Porter, his value chain model. As you see at the top, there are support activities. These include administrative, administration and management, legal, information technology, e-commerce, where we try to push the product out through e-commerce, procurement, personnel, human resources. And then we have primary activities. There are five basic primary activities. You can read them from left to right. This looks like general systems theory that we talked about earlier. Inbound logistics, these are the inputs where we, where we bring raw materials and employees into the organization. Operations, these are existing processes like manufacturing, packaging. Outbound logistics, where we push the product out. We have finished goods and we're pushing them out. Marketing and sales, these are the people who talk to the customers and entice them into buying the product and then we have customer service this is where we maintain our product sometimes we can make a tremendous amount of money through customer service actually when you go and you uh, for example when Caterpillar sells a giant tire uh, and they have to deliver it to a mine they can actually use that as a revenue source so when we coordinate all of these support and primary activities this is how we add value to the firm and you can see that this is not entirely easy to do So, your book defines value chain and a value system. A value chain is a sequence of activities through which the organization's inputs, whatever they are, are transformed into more valuable outputs, whatever they are. A value system includes the suppliers and that provide the inputs necessary to the firm along with their value chains. After the firm creates products, these products pass through the value chains of distributors, which also have their own value chains, all the way to the customers. All parts of these chains are included in the value system. Professor Porter has another contribution to this discussion. These are strategies for competitive advantage. Dr. Porter had three uh, strategies, and your book author adds two. Uh, these are a total of five. Cost leadership. Can you imagine a company that is a cost leader? Differentiation. How do, how do companies differentiate themselves? Innovation. Companies that are highly innovative. You can think about innovative companies companies with great operational effectiveness and then customer orientation and we can argue about what these should be you can think about your own and I can argue that Google for example has none of these strategies Google strategy is that they are fantastic at software development and, and so they have that niche so let's um, let's look at these uh, we, we develop strategic information systems based on these attempts at creating competitive advantage. We do this by helping the, or the organization implement its strategic goals and improve its performance and productivity. 
So let's look at these five. A good example for cost leadership would be Walmart. That's easy to think about. Differentiation would be Firefox. Firefox actually uh, is, is more resilient to viruses because it is not so popular as, uh, you know, for instance, any Microsoft product or IBM product. And innovation uh, is would be Apple, clearly one of the most valuable companies in the world, worth over a trillion dollars. Uh, there are many examples of this in, in IT. We now have, what, four companies that have passed the $1 trillion market capitalization rate, all based on innovation. Operational effectiveness would be FedEx, which actually uses information technology heavily. Customer orientation would be Amazon.com when they call you by name. They say, uh, hi, Bill, <coughs> hi, Jane, and they push suggestions to you. Uh, this is... Uh, Amazon trying to have a customer orientation. From this discussion, there are two broad concerns that we address in the MIS function. One is the organization's interests, organizational strategy. Uh, we'll refer to this as the business concern. And the other is how we apply information technology to support the business. And these two uh, factors need to be aligned. In other words, all of our information technology needs to be created to support the organization's strategy uh, and its tactical plans and its operational plans as well. So your book talks about business information technology alignment. This is the tight integration of the IT function with the organization's strategy, mission, and goals. Chapter 2 concludes with a case on IBM's Watson, which is an expert system that is used heavily in the healthcare industry. IBM's Watson can process structured and unstructured content, diagnose diseases, and recommend treatment, and incidentally won $1 million on Jeopardy. So that just shows the diverse applications of this expert system. So this concludes our chapter. Thank you.